Hello and welcome back. We're going to spend a few minutes talking about some of the uh, conundrums in oral pathology. I'll focus this time on odontogenic lesions. Very often these are cystic lesions and prevent, present a challenging differential diagnosis, which as you can see from this chart is rather lengthy. Uh, in reality, there are only a few critical distinctions here, and those are primarily uh, between uh, dentigerous cysts and ameloblastoma uh, and other calcifying or cystic neop neoplasms. The inflammatory and developmental cysts are relatively unimportant in terms of recurrence or significant pathology, but mistaking one of these for a neoplastic uh, lesion such as a <clears throat> keratocyst uh, it can be very problematic. The radicular cysts are usually very inflammatory and located here as you see in the apex of a tooth, often where there's been prior dental work as you see here. Uh, the lining will usually have some remnants of squamous mucosa, but also show edema and rather marked inflammation in the stroma surrounding it. Dentigerous cysts also are an inflammatory process that have typically a keratinized lining in much of the area, but may also have broad zones of inflammation and fibrosis, occasionally with cholesterol clefts. These are of generally normal thickness, similar to keratocysts, um, and usually present fairly early in life. They may be associated uh, very, more, more often with an unerupted tooth, so getting that history from your colleagues uh, is very important. The orthokeratinized odontogenic cyst is another lesion uh, which is really uh, analogous to an epidermal inclusion cyst. This tends to have a slightly thicker uh, cell uh, layer uh, and tends to make orthokeratin. Uh, that means that it has a granular layer. Finding that granular layer can in and of itself allow you to make this di diagnosis of orthokeratinized odontogenic cyst. Here's a breakdown of the odontogenic tumors, which again, as you see, is rather lengthy and uh, the differentials can be rather broad. <clears throat> They're divided into broad categories into those which have uh, epithelial elements only, so those which have epithelial and uh, ectomesenchymal lesions and those which are predominantly mesenchymal, ectomesenchymal lesions. Uh, we'll talk about these in some more detail. So first, the epithelial lesions with no ectomesenchyme. Um, here these fall into the uh, relatively benign category, although some of these have uh, um, recurrence potential, and the malignant category, which uh, need to be treated with much more respect. The odontogenic keratocyst is one of the most uh, more common lesions, and typically uh, it, it presents with a uh, cystic radiolucent mass, sometimes multiloculated, as you see here. Always nice in these Panorex films to compare the normal side to the abnormal side. Uh, it tends to be more common in men and occur in the 20s and 30s. Um, it does have some association with the basal cell nevus syndrome. Uh, though that is uh, fairly uncommon in and of itself. Uh, this also, like the uh, orthokeratinized uh, cyst, uh, has a 5 to 10 cell layer thickness, but as you see, there's not really a true granular layer here. Uh, there's keratinaceous material, but not a true granular layer. Instead, you get this sort of corrugated up and down uh, keratinized layer without a true granular layer. Now this is a neoplasm and will stain for uh, markers like P63 and P53 uh, and have a higher than average proliferation rate as you see here with KI67. Now occasionally you can get inflammation that can obscure this, uh, so you do need to look carefully at all of the cyst lining. Um, if you see the presence of so-called daughter cysts uh, in the wall out around here, that also is an important factor to identify and comment on. Ameloblastomas are also uh, reasonably common. Uh, 
Uh, again, they may be associated with an unerupted tooth, as you see here, uh, out here in the molar area. The mandible and the maxilla are relatively evenly uh, distributed in terms of location, and uh, these can have a very high recurrence rate. Uh, again, seen in adults, um, and uh, may be associated with some symptoms. The histology of a meloblastoma is, should be fairly familiar to you. Uh, it's characterized by this odontogenic type of epithelium, uh, which can be present in sheets and nests and cords, uh, oftentimes with small spaces between the stroma and the epithelium. It tends to have a peripheral palisading with central pallor and occasionally small cyst formation, as you see in several areas here. Uh, the cytology is usually quite low grade. Now, there is a malignant counterpart, which we refer to as a meloblastic carcinoma, which has similar features uh, in terms of some peripheral palisading, central pallor, some cyst formation, as you see here. But this will usually have higher grade cytology uh, and may present with ulceration, pain, and a uh, more aggressive, reactive, stromal type of appearance, as you see here, somewhat collagenized. Usually, it's not a difficult thing to distinguish this from the benign variants. The calcifying epithelial odontogenic tumor, or so-called Pindborg tumor, is a very interesting lesion. Uh, again, it presents in adults and has a fairly characteristic radiographic appearance with a very sharp border and this central calcification. Sometimes there may be an impacted tooth that's associated with this, uh, but this lesion also can be uh, locally aggressive. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is that it also produces amyloid um, and uh, may calcify and so forth. So here's an example of what this tumor looks like. You can see and pick out these calcifications. Uh, it's fairly cellular, nested, rounded cells. Um, not the peripheral palisading to the same extent that you see with the ameloblastoma by any means. Um, and here under polarized light, you can't see it well, um, but this is stained with Congo red. And when polarized, these amorphous uh, pink deposits uh, give off nice uh, birefringence uh, under polarized light, uh, giving away this uh, diagnosis of the Pinborg tumor. Adenomatoid odontogenic tumor is another tumor. Um, again, fairly typical radiographically with an unerupted tooth and even a much more pronounced fibrotic margin here, as you see. It, this translates to a very thick capsule. And as a consequence, these tumors have a fairly low recurrence rate if they're completely excised. Uh, they have several interesting components, um, uh, which pro provide clues to their name. Um, they produce enamel, some calcifications, and amyloid. This, together with the Pinborg tumor, are the two dental tumors that produce um, amyloid. Here's an example, fairly cellular. Here you see this very thick fibrotic capsule. And then there are little areas of dentin here, or enamel type of material, um, and a nested adenomatoid appearance, uh, as you see uh, corresponding to the name. A similar lesion, uh, also fairly easy to recognize, is the squamous odontogenic tumor. Uh, again, a fairly similar appearance uh, radiographically and clinically, uh, appearing in adulthood, cystic or lucent lesion with a somewhat sclerotic border. But in this case, rather than having a uh, typical uh, amylo am ameloblastic type of epithelium, you'll see definite squamous differentiation uh, rather than that central pallor and the peripheral palisading uh, that we would expect to see is missing in this tumor. Clear cell odontogenic carcinoma is a rare variant um, in addition to the uh, ameloblastic carcinoma that we've mentioned previously. And I bring this up because of the differential, which can include things like renal cell carcinoma, uh, clear cell squamous cell carcinomas, and so forth. Uh, this will be positive with a PAS for glycogen, and uh, PAN-CK and CK5-6 will be positive. But it will be negative for S100 myoepithelial markers. It would be negative for the RCC marker. Uh, 
and other sorts of things. If you see this little sense of peripheral palisading, you should be able to differentiate it from the typical uh, metastatic clear cell carcinoma uh, from renal origin. Also, it will arise in the bone um, rather than being, uh, as a primary tumor, rather than being metastatic. So this brings us to the mixed epithelial and ectomesenchymal lesions, which as you see includes these tumors, the calcifying cystic or dentinogenic ghost cell tumor, the ameloblastic fibroma or fibrodentinoma, the ameloblastic fibroodontoma, odontomas and ameloblastic odontomas are all in the benign side. And then there are a few um, carcinomas or malignancies, ameloblastic fibrosarcoma, for example, and odontogenic ghost cell carcinoma. These are fairly rare. The calcifying odontogenic or dentinogenic ghost cell tumor um, is a, an interesting lesion. It seems to be analogous somewhat, if you want to think of it this way, to the calcifying epithelioma in the skin. Um, this does have some recurrence risk. Um, and uh, here, as you see, it can occur in the maxilla uh, or in the mandible um, and is usually a somewhat mixed, lucent and opaque type of tumor. Oops. Um, it has uh, dense calcifications and it seems to form dentin here, an almost a, a small tooth, uh, <coughs> vestigial tooth formation. It's very densely calcifying and fibrotic, not very cellular tumor. Um, the ameloblastic fibroma, uh, in contrast, uh, doesn't have that dense fibrous tissue. And this is a fairly early onset lesion uh, that seems to be proliferating towards the dental papillae and ameloblastoma. Uh, here's what it looks like under the microscope. You see this mixture of epithelial and mesenchymal elements. Uh, they're clearly a ameloblastic type of tissue. And the stroma is a bland, fibromatous, uh, loose, mixoid uh, type of stroma without significant proliferative activity or atypia. Um, on a related uh, lesion, the ameloblastic fibroodontoma uh, has some of the features of ameloblastic fibroma, but seems to add to that the formation of odontogenic uh, elements in the form of dentin and maybe even enamel uh, or dental papillae. Uh, so the clue to naming these things is picking out the various elements that you see and making sure that uh, you fit it into the right category in terms of uh, what sorts of uh, elements are present in the tumor and belong in, therefore in the name. Uh, here's another example of an ameloblastic fibroodontoma. You can see quite different morphologies in various areas. Here's the more ameloblastic fibroma type of areas as you see up here, but coupled with um, dense um, lamellar uh, dentin type of tissue um, and maybe even a little bit of a papillae type formation there. Uh, so it fits nicely into this fibroodontoma category. The odontoma is uh, probably not really a true neoplasm but more likely to be the, a hamartoma and this is the most common odontogenic tumor. So you're likely to see some of these things. Uh, this recapitulates tooth formation with several different elements, dentin, cementum, and so forth. So uh, it has a very interesting histologic appearance. Here you see um, the papillae formation, the dentin, um, a little bit maybe of enamel uh, here in some areas here, uh, and it has just this very uh, diverse uh, hamartomatous uh, appearance to it. Now, in contrast, the, on the malignant side, the ameloblastic fibrosarcoma will have clear evidence of uh, ameloblastic type of differentiation, as you see here, uh, with this palisaded epithelium and so forth. But notice the stroma. It's much, much more cellular. Uh, and if we were to go to higher power, you could find mitoses and a little bit more atypia and proliferative activity in this setting. So uh, this is the kind of lesion where you look at it and you go, gee, it looks like an ameloblastic fibroma, but you see this cellular stroma and proliferative activity, and you really need to fall over to the malignant side of things.
In the pure mesenchymal category of tumors, uh, there are a few things to take note of. Uh, most of these are very rare. Uh, we will comment briefly about the cementoblastoma. Uh, this usually occurs fairly early in life, and as you can see here, uh, it's associated with a tooth. Um, it's calcifying. It's a little more common here in the mandible. That's why we pictured it here. And this has got clear differentiation towards a cementoblastic type of uh, material. Uh, it does have some recurrence risk if it's not completely excised. Um, and if you were to think of what it might compare to, it's probably close to an osteoblastoma in terms of differential diagnosis. But the key here is that you see that this uh, process is associated with a tooth. An osteoblast could occur in the jaw, osteoblastoma could occur in the jaw, but would not have this intimate association with the tooth. Here's what it looks like under the microscope. You get broad zones and bands with a blastic type of intervening uh, mesenchymal tissue uh, forming this uh, uh, cementum uh, and giving this dense, hard appearance. It may take days sometimes to decalcify these specimens uh, because they can be so uh, densely calcified. Here's another uh, picture showing you some of the higher power view. And notice just how much uh, cementum type material there is. There may be a little reactive bone-like appearing tissue around it, but you should recognize this as being much more cellular, excuse me, much more dense than the usual bone would be, and the amount of intervening matrix tends to be small. Okay, that's where we'll pause for this section.